That might help now. I just check it. Over these last three weeks, technology aid. I've been trying to prepare us as a church for our new church year. For those of you that are new in this morning, you probably think that's crazy. Why does a year start in September? Well, anybody who's got kids will tell you why that a year starts in September, and that works for us. We work through from September to August, and we have a really busy year. We have lots of things that we look forward to, and you've seen this last year, for those of you that have been here this last year, all of the things that I hope that we will do as a church, and I have no intention of changing that, of repeating that. Obviously not doing it exactly the same, but repeating it. We will again at Christmas have the special events that we had around Christmas. Why? Because people naturally come to church at Christmas. If they've never been to church in their life, we may not agree with people who do that. We might believe in our hearts very sincerely that church is something, or should we say that the Lord is somebody that we should worship day in and day out. And church is a good place to come and do that. But for some people, well, they feel a sense of duty to come at Christmas. And so I'm going to take advantage of that duty. And we're going to take advantage of it even more by trotting all the children out in front of them and then we're going to preach the gospel. Why? Because we want to see people get saved. We want to see people accept Jesus. But they need to accept Jesus. They don't need to fall for gimmicks. But they're here. And they can hear the gospel. And so we will preach it. Easter is another one of those events. And so in our spring term, we'll work towards Easter. And then summer, there's nothing. So we invented one. And we called it Ice Cream Sunday. And there's no reason we won't do that again. And if you remember, I told you four things in the year that I wanted to do. Starting off at the beginning of September, that we have a time of celebration together. Because we should always thank the Lord before we start any endeavor. Always give him the grace. And give him the thanks for that is there before us. Christmas and Easter. And then in summer, we will have once again our conference week. So now you know how it works. Now you've seen it in action. This is the time of year for us to make it even more exciting. And it's time for you to start to ask yourself, what can I do and be a part of that? Our vision for the church has always been the same and will always be the same, as I've told you that it's based around the Great Commission, that we will get to know Christ Jesus as our beloved. Now that statement in itself teaches us that we need to know the Lord as a very close person in our lives. Not over-familiarly, but as husband. Very close. That we will know Christ Jesus as beloved. How will we do that? By studying his word. That we will get to know him better. You won't do it through hyped up music and a light show. You won't do it through waiting for the latest Christian clairvoyant to come forward and lay hands upon you and tell you what the will of God is for your life. You will do it by studying the Word of God. And every one of you, as far as I know, can read in here. So there is no excuse. We can all go before the Lord. And if you can't afford a Bible, stay in a hotel and steal one. And then you can... <laughs> then you've got one. <laughs> and then finally, we need to stop being introspective and locked away. Yesterday I arrived back from our holiday to find Vicky and her family out on the lawn, spiking themselves on the what was left of those, uh, the hedges that have come down. And the hedges have been there for a number of years as far as I know, but everybody I asked can't remember when they went in. Possibly they came in with the building. But so many people come to our church and go, oh, I didn't know there was a church on Wensley Road. We've been here for 40 years. This is our 40th year. It is time for us to look open so that we can share the message of salvation that we love and take so freely in our hearts that is such a wonderful thing that has been given to us as gift and stop pretending we don't share. You can't have it. We must 
begin to share it with all of those people whom we inhabit, whom we get to know, whom we go to work with or go to school with or go to college with or meet or even live with, that we get that opportunity to do that. That's our vision. That will never change. But this year, as I've said to you, we have a direction. And it's thanking the Lord. This is a year of celebration. It's a time for us to celebrate and give thanks. Not for what the Lord might do in the future, thinking if we clap really loud, then all the fairies will come back to life again. And they'll give us the magic that we want. But that we praise the Lord because he's already blessed us with so much. Too many people think that they've got to scream out louder. Cast themselves down louder. Do so much craziness to try and listen to the ear of God. And there's only one place that that is seen in scripture. And it was the prophets of Baal. They were doing that to try and get Baal to consume their offering. And as Elijah mocked and said, well, maybe your God is on the toilet. But we don't need to do that for the living God. We don't need to do that for Christ Jesus. We don't need to tear ourselves up and chuck ourselves on the ground and be silly and talk about nonsense. It isn't all required for God to hear us. Because God made this promise that he will always hear the prayers that are made in his temple. And through Paul's writing, he taught us that every single one of us who have accepted Christ Jesus as Savior are the temple of the living God. Not this building. This isn't the only place where God hears his prayers. But wherever you are, no matter how complicated or uncomplicated the prayer is, God is there. He hears it. He wants to listen to it. He wants to fellowship with you and wants to bless you. And so we have much to celebrate. And so this is a year of celebration where we give thanks to the Lord for what he's already given us. But there's a little extra onto that. And then we dedicate it back to him. And over these last three weeks, I've given us lots of reasons why we should be thankful. Not for blessings to come. Not if we follow the 15 steps, then God is going to unlock the riches of heaven. Or any of that nonsense that it pervades every element of the church now. There is no way you can turn without hearing this stuff. And so we have to say enough is enough. And realize that that isn't a blessing. It really isn't. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The sun shines on the righteous, yes, and the unrighteous alike. The blessings of God are to know him and to know him as Savior. That is the blessings of God. And for those who have accepted Christ Jesus as Savior, you have that. And we were given a number of things I've looked at over the first weeks. Of course, accepting Christ Jesus as Savior is not just an initiation into a club. It isn't the way you get in the door, the way you unlock the rest of the blessings. It itself, it is a blessing that almost two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament, What you have in Christ Jesus, they didn't have in the law. You can boldly enter right into the Holy of Holies. And I know I say that a lot to you. And we have this, I don't know whether you do, I do. Whenever a door is shut to you, you can't go in there. That's when you want to go in there. That's the place I want. They've told me I can't have it. I want it. I didn't know if I wanted it, but now I can't have it. I want it. It's always the worst, isn't it? When people say that you can't have it, I want it. But you couldn't go in the temple. Only the Levites could. You couldn't go in the holy place. Only the priests could. You couldn't go in the holy of holies. Only the high priest could. But Jesus tore that veil. 
as Paul said there in 2 Corinthians. That veil stood over them. They didn't understand the God who was behind it. They didn't understand why he did it. They didn't understand who he was. And sometimes I wonder if we do understand this. But all of Scripture, the great length of it from the beginning to the end is this great promise that the Lord wanted to fellowship with you and with me. Fellowship isn't just he wants to be your friend, although Jesus does want to be your friend. It's so much more than that. It's lifting you up when you are down. It's rejoicing with you when you are joyful. It is a companion in the valley of the shadow of death. And his rod and his staff will come for you. And that's what salvation gives to each and every one of us. And kings and prophets long to see what we see. And as we sung today, the wonder of the cross. We must never lose the wonder of the cross. It is not the gateway to a club, but it is the opening to something that so many long to see. The Shekinah glory of God. When Moses was in the Shekinah glory, his face glowed with the presence of God. There are many things that we may want in life, and sometimes it isn't the presence of God that we seek after. But it should be. Because it's the greatest thing that we can seek after. The Lord promised us that he will give us rest. Not rest from never working again, but rest from a confused moral system in the world. And we do have a confused moral system in the world. Utterly confused. It contradicts. It makes no sense. People who try to be a good person in terms of the law of the land will find themselves falling foul of something else because it contradicts. And above all, it contradicts the word of God. But man cannot put together as good a government as Christ our Lord could. And so we were promised that that confusing system that is the world, with all their morals and their don't do this and do do that, can be replaced if we'll take that burden off and replace it with the yoke of Christ Jesus, which is easy and light, although it might not feel like it. That is to love one another as Christ loved you. And how did Christ love you? Well, no greater love has a man than he who gives his life for another. Agape love. That great replacement. From the selfish world to the blessings of God that we can have. We were given that great promise. We were promised that we would not be left alone. And though the Lord Jesus was to leave, he would send the comforter. He would be with us always. We would not be left as orphans, but we would be adopted children, adopted into his family, into his promises. And of course, Jesus promised that he went to prepare a place for us, that we might abide in the Father and the Father in us, that we might know that we are his. And Jesus said, if I didn't mean it, I wouldn't have said it. He is gone to prepare a place. And where he is, you may be also. And that is astronomical because you don't deserve to go to heaven. You might think you do, but you don't. Not one of us in this room deserves it. None of us. We haven't been that good person that everybody says, oh, I've been a good person, I'll go to heaven. Well, we know we haven't. Because that standard is the law and we all fell short of it. But Jesus went and prepared a place for us because he knew he had made a way where there was no way. And there's lots and lots. Finally, last week, I showed you that Christ is our beloved husband-to-be, our betrothed one. And of course, we have a wedding next week. But the Lord has put all things under Christ Jesus' seat. 
A husband is to protect and to love his wife. And a wife is to protect and love her husband. They are to share with things one another. Our marriages never work out to be that. They always fall short somewhere. But our marriage with Christ Jesus will never fall short of that. Our husband-to-be, Christ Jesus, is the perfect one. And it tells us all things are subject to Christ Jesus. All things are under his feet. When he comes in glory, when he comes at the second coming, on that great and terrible day of the Lord, to judge the earth, all these things are subject to him. And it says, to the church. The husband who does something that he wants to share and show with the person he loves. That is it. An existence that is shared with Christ Jesus. Now I could think of no other greater things and I could read today a lot more in Scripture and pull out a lot more reasons why we already have blessings in God that we don't need to seek after anything else Desire because we haven't finished the first plate yet. And actually, there's nothing great to it. The Lord has given us these wonderful things. But today, I don't want to give us any more reasons, even though there are infinitely more. I want to move on to what being thankful is. If you remember, our whole thing is taken from the Feast of Pentecost. For the Jews, they would have three celebrations in the year, three feasts. For every other Jewish male, they wouldn't come to the temple, only at these three feasts. They would only come at these three feasts. So the first one is Passover followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and on the first day, they would take a sheaf of barley and wheat, and they would dedicate it to God, and then they would count 50 days. Those 50 days, like an advent calendar, taking them to the Feast of Pentecost. And of course, I won't repeat myself again. We all should now, by now, who grabbed hold of this idea that the harvest wasn't sure. This isn't 50 happy days like counting down to Christmas, hoping that you get the presents you want, hoping that you get the presents you want. These are 50 days wondering whether you're going to feed your family at the end of these 50 days. Is the rain going to come at the right time? Is the harvest going to come? Is snow going to come? Is the whole lot going to be ruined? Is there going to be enough? 50 days. Nobody touches a single grain. Nobody takes a single part. Nobody has any bit of it until the day of Pentecost. And then that day. Well, let's have a look at that day. Turn with me, if you can, with your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. And I'm reading from verse 15. And it says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed, 50 days. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. You shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with the grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Hallelujah. On that day, that Sabbath day, a great and mighty celebration. They will bring all of these offerings to give thanks to the Lord for the harvest that has come. Today we're looking at what it is to give thanks. What it is and what it isn't. 
And on this day, having waited 50 days, having gone through the agony of it, a great rejoicing poured out the people all in Jerusalem ready to give the Lord. They are given these things to give to God. And the Jews would not partake of the harvest until the Lord had had his offering first. It was the Lord first and then after. We read from this offering, first of all, that they had the rams and the bulls and the drink and the grain offering, which were all burnt offerings. When we've looked at the book of Numbers and we looked at chapters 28 and 29, we know that the burnt offerings are in reference to the same thing that we do when we come and sing praises and worship. The burnt offering was put upon the altar and it was burnt completely. Nothing was left of it. And we're given four words that explain what it is. First of all, it's a korban, which in other words means it's a free will offering. You give it of your own free will as our praise and worship to the Lord should always be something that's given, not forced out of you. Not, oh, I'm here, I'll do it if I must. Something you wish to bring. A moed, which means an appointed time, a time you have set aside. This is time I am going to give the glory to the Lord and praise and worship him and give him thanks. That it tells us that it would be a sweet-smelling savour. Anybody that's like me, that loves cooking meat, that smell wafting in the air. I can imagine Jerusalem smelling absolutely lovely. But of course, that isn't because God was sitting on a moonbeam and the whole thing was there or up upon the sun or on the moon. God isn't literally above. Smell rises and it tells us this, that the Lord God is above all things, literally and figuratively, but he isn't sitting on the moon. But it tells us he's above all things. And finally, we are told that the fat of the offering is the Lord's. It's his part of the meal. It's classed as a meal, a love meal between you and God, as though sitting down and having food together. That sounds like my kind of worship. And this was God's part of it. And we equate it to this great promise that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. All of those things we have in that offering, that offering is offered a lot. That offering is offered with everything practically. And it's important that that is the very basis and basic of our offerings. But other things are offered with it as well. We're also offered a sin offering, a goat. This isn't to pay price for their sins so that they can now come and offer their offering because the sin, the blood of goats and lambs and bulls do not pay the price of sin. Only Christ Jesus did. It was to remind them that without the shedding of blood, there is still a barrier between man and God. That barrier is your sin. But with the shedding of blood, that of Christ Jesus, that gap is closed. That blockage is taken out. That sin is paid for. But the last thing that they were told to offer was bread. Two barley loaves made with fine flour, baked with leaven. And they're fascinating things. This is the only time that such loaves are offered. They're brought out and they are quite literally waved before the Lord as his offering. There for him. What is it that this is teaching us and what is it that I want to bring across? Well, making bread is a process. See, we're talking about our thanksgiving and our praises to the Lord. And this is an offering of first fruits. The harvest has been gathered. Nobody's allowed to have been eaten. We think of it maybe in the same terms of a harvest festival. But nobody has any until God's had his till it's been offered and given to him. So they could just cut down a sheaf of each field, bring it to the temple, bring it before the Lord and say, there you are, Lord. We know and acknowledge that you are the one that has grown all of these crops. We acknowledge that the reason that we can eat is because of you. 
You are the one that's given us all of this. We acknowledge it and there is yours. And it will be divided amongst the Levites and the priests as their cost and therefore uh, the whole system works. But we've given God his best. But that isn't good enough for the Lord. He didn't want them to just bring what he had given them. He had given them that. One might sow, another might reap, but it's God that gives the increase. He didn't want them just to come and give back what he had already given to them. He wanted the process. I don't know how many of you in here make your own bread. We're a fan of, although I have to watch it on the playback, the great British baker. Oh, that woman this week. Throwing ice cream about. Now, for half of you looking at me, I don't know. Get in, it's full of intrigue and excitement. No. But they'll be making bread soon. Making bread, even just making a loaf, is hard work. But there's a process that's involved in it. First of all, it says making the bread with fine flour. So the flour had to be made fine. And you can go to countless working museums up and down this country and mills and quarries that will show you how old-fashioned and water wheels and, and, of course, the windmills that are used to make Fine flour, the process of milling and crushing and sifting and then crushing again and then sifting again until you've got it so fine. It isn't an easy job. It's a considerably difficult job. It is a process that has to be done. It's taking the fruits that God has given you and doing so much more with them, putting such great effort just to make the flour. Then comes the back-breaking work of actually making the bread kneading it and working out on it and punching it and throwing it at the kids and doing all the things that you have to do with bread. I don't make bread. So all of the things that you have to do to get it to rise, to get it to... All of that process, which is not a simple thing, it is hard work. The resting and the leaving and the resting. And imagine doing all of this in a hot country as well. And all of that work together to make a loaf that you're not going to eat. You're going to give it away. You're going to give it to the Lord. And his priests are going to wave it. And you're going to look at that bread being waved and go, five blooming hours I spent on that loaf. <laughs> and then you're going to watch the priest eat it. And we're taking the first fruits all the blessings that God has given us. And we haven't just come and returned them and said, there you go, thanks very much. A process has been involved. With our hands, we have taken what God has given us and we have used it, not for your glory, but entirely for his glory, entirely for his work entirely for his effort and for thanks to him. The rest he's given to you. He's done it. He's poured it out. And now you've got to take it and use it and run with it and bless the Lord with it. And of course, this bread is mixed with leaven. Now, leaven always means sin in the Bible. Why is this bread mixed with leaven? Many believe because the day of Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out. It was, of course, the beginning of the Gentiles to get saved. It's a mix of the Gentiles. But the Gentiles don't own sin. The sin is for Jews and for Gentiles. We all commit it. Jews ate unleavened bread. They didn't eat leavened bread. But they could. Unless it was the feast of unleavened bread. They ate unleavened bread. And the reason is, is because, well, our works, our righteousness is like filthy rags. But the Lord still wants the effort. He still wants the work. He still wants you to put the process in and give thanks for what he has done 
for you. What we give back to God is always imperfect. It's always tainted by us. But we should do it in the spirit anyway. But the Lord takes that imperfect thing and it is good to him because he understands that we have taken what he has given us and we have used it for his glory. And in our imperfection, providing we used it for his glory, we have done what he asked. And he still wants that effort in our praise and our thanksgiving. So let's see this in action. I'm just going to turn to Mark chapter 14. And I'm going to read verses 3 to 9. Here we have it in action. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant amongst themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. This is the Passion Week. And as Jesus spoke in Jerusalem by day, in the evening he retired to the very near town of Bethany, where he waited. Bethany means house of palms. This is a representation of the church. This is the house of a man called Simon the leper. An unfortunate name, we can presume his mother didn't name him that. But rather it tells us something about him. The woman we know from John 11 was Mary, the brother of Lazarus, the sister to Martha. Lazarus had very, very recently been raised from the dead. Simon Presumably, he wasn't a leper anymore. Because if he was a leper, he certainly wouldn't be allowed to have people in his house. And people wouldn't be allowed to be in his house. If Jesus had gone into the house of this leper, he would be unclean and would be unable to go into Jerusalem. He would be unable to be the Passover lamb. So Simon, it shouldn't be Simon the leper. It should be Simon was a leper but he isn't anymore. Now, leprosy was an incurable disease at that time. Leprosy was not a disease that could be cured. It's not a disease that can be easily cured today. But it was not a disease that was curable. It was a death sentence. When you had leprosy upon your life, you were the walking dead. You were classed as dead. In fact, you were legally classed as dead. Your children now inherited your goods. You were shunned from society. You were moved outside. You were not allowed to be in the presence of other people. You could never go to the temple again. You could never worship God with other people. You could only be with other lepers. Jesus had come and healed this man and done a miracle in his life. He was dead and now he was alive again. And of course, that is exactly the same as every one of us. We were dead, just like a leper, the walking dead. We lived, but we were dead. We were condemned to hell. Christ Jesus made us alive again by his miraculous power. And as he said, which is it easier to say, be healed or your sins are forgiven? And the answer is they're both as equally as hard and they can only both be done by God. And the Lord did it. He paid that price. We who were dead were made alive again. Each one of us is like Simon the leper. And Simon the leper here opened his house to Jesus in his retinue. He was hospitable, as every good Christian should be. He had an open house. It was enough. He had people in. Had a lot of people in, if you read John 11. He had this great thing to praise. Whereas Mary, we're told, breaks open a jar of costly spikenard. She worships the Lord 
pouring it upon his head and his feet, wiping his feet with her hair, crying out great tears in front of this great group of men. In a Jewish feast, women did not sit. It was their job to serve. They were to serve the men, and until all the men were served, the women could not sit. I don't think that would go down well today. But here is a woman who was not serving. Not in the practical sense. She'd come and she'd poured out before the Lord. Because she did it, she was decried by the crowd saying that she could have given this to the poor. I've talked about that before. I'm not going to go down that element of this at all. To the crowd, Simon was the hero. Mary was the oversensitive Pentecostal Pamela. We've all met them. They're the ones that feel everything and see everything. Simon was the hero. But to Jesus, Mary was the hero. Why? They'd both given something to the Lord. For Simon, it required no effort other than opening his house up. The only reason he could have people in his house was because Jesus had healed him. That was the only reason. So God had given him something and he just gave it straight back. The reason that Mary was coming to praise is because her brother had been raised from the dead. But she did something a little bit more. She went to an absolute great effort. She brought an anointing oil that would have been an heirloom, probably even a dowry for her as a family, and she broke it open and poured it upon this poor carpenter's head and feet. She, in front of other people, allowed herself to be ridiculed so that she could give and praise the Lord. She poured out all that she could. She gave so much more than she had received. In glory to the Lord. And it's not about the financial cost of what she gave. It was about the heart that was behind it. Because she gave a great effort, both financially, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's what is important. That she poured herself into it. She gave the very best. Whereas Simon simply returned the gift that he was given. And so that's the challenge that we are given from the Feast of Pentecost. The loaves that were waved, the great effort that was put into the process, the whole thing says, if God has given something to you, what are you going to do with it? Well, here's your 10%, God, thanks very much. It's got nothing to do with that. Because it all belongs to the Lord. And therefore we take it and we take the process and we pour out ourselves into that entirely for the glory of God. This is what it says in Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one. To each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who received the one went and dug in the ground, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. But look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. But look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, 
gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. To each is given a considerable different amount. But they're all servants before the Lord. They all have equality. But each has a different calling. Each has a different gift. Each has a different measure. What do you do with that measure? To everybody in this room who has accepted Jesus as Savior, you have heard these promises that have been poured out in equality to each and every one of you. But so much more has God given you in your lives and you know it. What will you do with that gift, that talent? God has given us that and we must dedicate it back to him. But not by just pouring out back to him what he's given to us. By taking that and being diligent with it. Now I'm not talking about money. So take that out of your mind. I'm talking about talents. And I'm not talking about ones you go on the X Factor with. I am talking about the giftings that God has put in your heart. The dreams that the Lord has placed upon you. Don't just do the least that you can get away with. Do the most that you can do. Because this is for the living Savior. It's for his glory. It's for his goodness. It is a gift that's been given to him. And we are wicked, it says. If we just take what God has given us and say, cheers, God, and are not prepared to invest. Again, one of those buzzwords. But actually, if we're not prepared to put ourselves into everything that God has given us, what else are we building? If we're not building for the kingdom of heaven, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. Friends, that is what thanksgiving is. If we are truly thankful for what God has given us, then give him the barley loaves. Put in the process. Yes, he wants your praises and worship, but not that he needs them. Yes, we know that we must remember the sin sacrifice, which is why the gap is closed and we can come into the presence of God. But the first fruits belong to God. And he doesn't just want them back. He wants you to do something with them and then give them him back. You weren't giving to dig it in a hole and make sure it didn't get damaged. You were giving it to produce a return. The Lord wants that from each and every one of us. That's what he expects from each and every one of us. Friends, that's what thanksgiving is. It isn't throwing yourself on the floor and declaring, if I do all of this, then God will bless me. It's remembering that God has blessed you and using those blessings for his glory. I don't know whether Mary knew that she was anointing Jesus for burial. But in so doing, she fulfilled prophecy. In doing what the Lord has put in your heart to do, you are fulfilling the will of God. People seek the will of God all the time. They're desperate, desperate for somebody to come and tell them what God wants them to do. But it's in the word of God. And it's summed up in this great statement, friends, that you can say every morning, how can I serve you today, Father? How can I serve you today? Let's just pray. Father, we thank you because you do love us. 
Because you do give us good gifts, as you say, Father Lord. If we, being wicked, know how to give good gifts, how much so you, our Heavenly Father, know how to give good gifts, and you have. And so, Lord, we say, as we use those things, Lord, bless us, encourage us, Lord, 